Welcome again to this discussion of sustainability. I'm Paul Woodruff. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate Studies. As I was coming in this morning, I asked myself whether my method of transportation is sustainable. I was pedaling, and I began to think it to sustain my bicycling habit takes a fair amount of food, rubber for the tires, batteries for the lights, metal for the replacement parts. And I began to wonder whether all of those things were produced in sustainable ways. And then I thought about education and how from the beginning of education, as we understand it, learning has depended on some form of writing, which requires wax tablets, stone tablets, paper, ink, I don't know what all, over the millennia. And now it requires an enormous amount of electricity to maintain a learning establishment. And again, I wondered how much of these supplies that we use in learning are sustainable. And perhaps we'll get some answers to those questions today. I have to introduce, I have the pleasure of introducing a very distinguished group of people. First of all, the moderator, Jim Walker, is, uh, well, he's quite distinguished. In, in uh, a few years ago, he was named under 40 Austinite of the Year. And I'm not going to say the year, but it was quite recent. <laughs> that he was actually an under 40 Austinite of the Year. Came to Austin as a carpenter from Oregon, got interested in straw bale house building, which is a very interesting, sustainable method of construction. Went to school, learned more about it, uh, spent 11 years involved in sustainability indicators. He was involved in planning the Mueller Airport redevelopment, and uh, three years ago was appointed the first director of the UT Office of Sustainability. Dr. John Daly, in the blue shirt, uh, is a distinguished teaching professor, Department of Communication Studies, College of Communication, and also in the Department of Management at the Red McComb School. He is the Liddell Centennial Professor of Communication. His interests focus on practical ways of improving the communication skills of individuals. He's examined topics like shyness, personality difference, and generally the way people advocate their ideas, which is why his latest book, which came out just last year, is called Advocacy. And I believe copies of that are for sale at the front desk. He teaches one of the most popular courses at the university on interpersonal communication and is a much loved professor. Dr. James Pennebaker, distinguished teaching professor and chair of the Department of Psychology and Liberal Arts. He's the Regent Centennial Professor of Liberal Arts in the, uh, wait a minute, I skipped a bit. Uh, he is a Regent Centennial Professor. Uh, he received his PhD at this university in 1977. He's been on the faculty at the University of Virginia, Southern Methodist University, and since 1997, the University of Texas. Uh, he and his students are exploring the links be between traumatic experiences, expressive writing, natural language use, and physical and mental health. I personally have found his books fascinating, and I've had a number of discussions with him about the philosophy of emotions, a subject on which he does interesting work uh, that connects very closely with, with mine. He's the author or editor of nine books, and over, this can't be right, 250 articles? That is correct. Over 250 <laughs> articles. Yes, this, is not, this is not over. under 250. It's over, right, okay. <laughs> I've done under 250, I can guarantee that. His latest book is called The Secret Life of Pronouns, which leads me to ask him whether you can sustain the use of the first person. Maybe he'll answer that during the discussion. Uh, these are wonderful speakers. They are beloved teachers and researchers. Uh, we have a great moderator. Enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Woodruff, uh, and thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, this also marks the first in what we hope to be a, a long-running series, uh, a collaboration between the President's Sustainability Steering Committee, the Office of Sustainability, and the Undergraduate School. Uh, so thank you all for being part of the, the first, the start of something. Um, 
as we heard the bios and as I looked into the biographies of, of both of you, uh, one of the words that doesn't appear anywhere is sustainability. Hmm. And just huh. as a... <laughs> <laughs> Write that down right now. <laughs> and so as a, a, as a thought also to the, to the audience here, what we're not going to talk about tonight is kind of the nuts and bolts, uh, the science, the, um, the, the hard stuff about sustainability, how efficient we are, what the drought is. Uh, feel free to ask those kind of questions. It's not the kind of direction we're going tonight. Where we are going is looking at this word and what it means or what it doesn't, what the ideas behind it uh, might mean or, or have in them, how to look at them how to listen better, uh, it's the language around sustainability. And that really, that the word sustainability, as we've talked about, uh, as I'm sure you all have experienced, gets used a lot. It's a ubiquitous word. It's overused. It's used so much, it's probably lost a lot of the impact and the, and the power that it might have, have once had, if it ever had any. <laughs> um, so this is a worthwhile thing to spend our time on tonight. Because as undergraduates, you get that word, sustainability, every day, and it's an exciting word, it's a hopeful word to, to some people, uh, but we need to dissect it so that you can develop your own sense of what does that mean for yourself or for your studies or for your time here at UT. Um, and, and as we were, we were talking, I, as the three of us tried planning out this, this, uh, this, this event, I found myself challenged several times by you, by both of you, about my assumptions and the way I use language around it. So I'm very excited about that. It's the purpose of higher education is to have that kind of dialogue. Uh, so I want to thank you both for, for being here tonight. Um, John, why don't we, we ask you to start first and give a few words and then uh, Jamie will go. I'll try to ask a few smart questions, hopefully. Uh, then we'll get to audience questions. So please start thinking about what you might want to inquire about. But let me kick it over. All right. My name is John Daly. I study influence. I'm fascinated by why some movements have impact, other movements don't. Why it is that some politicians are more successful than other politicians. And when I thought of the word sustainability, and I started saying, now, if I wanted to sell sustainability, wanted to convince people to be sustainable, how would it go about it? I'm not sure it's been done very successfully so far. Partly because the word doesn't work for me, all right? I don't know what the opposite of sustainability is. I don't know how it would be non-sustainable in some ways. So for example, a forest fire good or bad thing in terms of sustainability? Well, it depends. It destroys some people's lives. It destroys homes. You have to rebuild the homes. You talk to anyone in the area of forestry, though, tell forest fires are absolutely critical for the earth in some ways, right? You talk about anything, you know, anything you think about that matches the sustainability model, I could argue is also a non-sustainable thing and vice versa. Words do count. I believe the words you choose really do matter sometimes. They do have consequences. In fact, I think the mistake we make is we oftentimes don't think words matter, and so we slip with them. We need to be more careful with them. But assuming most of you believe in sustainability, and I think I probably do mostly too, the question is, why is it not more effectively used? Why don't people behave more sustainably? So I spent a few minutes thinking about this, and I use a model of persuasion that's very simple, but I think it helps us understand that. First thing, anytime you want to persuade people, you got to create a need. Like it or not, the secret of change is some degree of pain. If you're in an airport and you have a headache, you'll pay anything for an aspirin. I don't think anyone in airports ever said, my God, I need a vitamin. All right? You've got to create some sense of pain to get people's attention. How do you do that? You oftentimes have to answer the why now question. The why now question is a very important and indeed provocative question about any social movement. Why should we do this right now? Why didn't we do it six years ago, and why didn't we do it from nine years from now? What makes this the perfect moment? Truly, people will wait if they can. And if nothing's gone different, why change what we've done? How many of you have reasonably good lives right now? Why fool with them? Why fool with them? Anyone who's going to be effective persuading people about a social issue particularly has got to explain the why now question. We could have done it 30 years ago in sustainability. Why should we do it now? And if we wait another three years, what's there? I don't see any difference, most people will say. Why can't we postpone it? So sustainability advocates need to be able to figure out that why now question immediately. To do that, they do a couple things. One is they've got to constantly find new evidence. One mistake that we make is we think old evidence is persuadable. It's not. If I ask some of you what the warning label on a cigarette pack is, you'll probably say, warning, cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health. 
That hasn't been on any cigarette pack for more than 20 years. First thing Surgeon General Coop did when he became Surgeon General was get rid of that warning. Now there are four randomly assigned warnings, and no one notices why they're smokers. What did they recently try to do? Introduce 20 different warnings along with pictures. The evidence says no ad on TV today will be on six months from now. First time you see it, great ad. Second time, it sounded, I want to TiVo it. Third time, I look for it on YouTube. Fifth time, I go to the kitchen or bathroom. Sustainability, if it's going to be successful, has to find compelling new evidence on a regular basis. The mistake is the same speech is done over and over again, whatever that speech is. But second, it's got to be vivid. Vividness has a huge, huge value to it. The mistake about sustainability is it's a very analytic concept in most cases. You don't demonstrate, in my mind at least, a deep sense of vividness. People remember vivid stuff. In fact, one vivid example will overwhelm wealths of data. Mistake people do is they believe data matters. It really doesn't. So I work with NASA sometimes. I asked somebody at NASA one time, how fast the space shuttle flew when it flew in space? By the way, which is probably sustainable, okay? This is gravity. All right. They said we go 17,600 miles per hour. I said, damn, that's fast. And they said, it's lickety split fast, and you have no idea what it means. I said, none whatsoever. We see a sunrise and a sunset every 45 minutes. We go five miles a second. What got my attention more, 17,600 miles per hour or sunrise, sunset every 45 minutes? Anyone who wants to advocate for some cause needs a vivid case, a compellingly vivid case. Sandy Bill has been around so long, I'm not sure we see about vivid cases. I'm sure there are out there. But the advocates have got to be careful because if they rumor monger that thing and make it too vivid, they lose their credibility as well. You also have to be trusted. And for some reason, in this case, sustainability has actually been framed by its opponents as being something manipulative in some way, matter or form. I'm not sure how that happened. It'd be a very interesting question. Rush Limbaugh may have a play. Who knows who played a role, all right? But it's kind of suspicious, and every time something comes up that indicates some possibility of that, it gets reframed again. So we know in political science, for example, the media frames candidates. Go back to the 2000 election. Al Gore was framed as basically a liar at some point. George Bush was framed as a bumbler of some sorts. So when George Bush said something wrong, they said, eh, it's just, he's a bit bumbler. Doesn't know much about it, he's making an easy mistake. Gore says something, they frame it as a liar. And interesting enough, if you look at that climate change data that came out of the emails from climate change, it didn't get framed as one or two people, one or two emails. It got framed as a conspiracy, basically. So when you really want to change somebody's opinion, you've got to frame it in a way that's different. It's always easier to be against something than before something for people. And that's the challenge that exists in the office. Second thing, you've got to have a plan. Any problem needs a solution. Oftentimes, what advocates for issues do is they propose a solution before they created pain. And you never get traction that way. You get a lot of pushback. You always got to create the problem in people's mind before people want to listen to your plan. Now, what do you know about plan? The plan has to be very specific in some ways. People need to do something. Theories and attitudes and persuasion always presume for many years that if you change your attitude, behavior follows. There are people who make the exact opposite case. If I get you to behave differently, your attitude will follow. If I were a strong sustainability advocate, not that I'm against it, but it's not my big area of research, I would argue the way to get people more focused on what you call sustainability would be getting them to behave differently in some way, matter or form. If I do something, I end up believing it in some cases. Oftentimes, when we ask people to make changes, they'll agree to the change, but nothing happens. But if you give them a pathway behaviorally, they will start doing something different. If I want you to donate to charity, I don't simply say charity is a good thing. There are great causes. I ask you to give me some money. I ask you to ask your neighbors for money. I give you a behavior, and after a while, you psychologically say, damn, I'm doing this all the time. I must believe in it. Sustainability needs to lay out pathways for each person if they want to contribute to it. Thirdly, you've got to offer benefits to people. Very basic principle in influence. You gotta show people there's something in it for them. And it's gotta be an immediate win, not a long-term win. Like it or not, no one focuses on long-term issues. Maybe they should, but they don't. I'll give you $50 today, I'll give you 100 two years from now. Give me the 50 right now, who knows what's gonna happen? Everyone wants an immediate win. And you've gotta be very careful if you cannot find some immediate win. And sustainability, what's the immediate win? That would be my question. 
You need to get some progress right away if people are going to go along with you. Recent research at Harvard, for example, defines they found a good day at work is best defined as simply making progress on something, <laughs> getting something checked off the list. Trouble with sustainability from an outsider's perspective is that it oftentimes doesn't seem to have any quick wins. It's a long-term thing to maintain as opposed to change. And you've also got to be very careful. You've got to come up with something that has some payoff that makes sense to them. One of the most sustainable companies in the world, it's going to sound crazy, is Walmart. <laughs> Walmart for the last five years have been pushing light bulbs in a very different way. Walmart has actually saved $3.8 billion in the last five years on just packaging material. How many of you know that? Now, their notion was what? It shot them with children's toys. The packaging was too big. It was actually a pain to ship. It was a pain to stock. One guy said, why do we have so much packaging on these toys? It seemed like a hassle. It didn't get attention. But what he did is that one truck actually was the pilot case. They reduced the packaging by essentially half, and guess what? More toys sold because they got more on the shelf. In the end, $3.8 million simply on packaging equipment. Understand, you overpackage things oftentimes, you don't need to. The win for Walmart was a couple. Number one, they saved a lot of money real quick. Number two, it appealed to a certain group of consumers very significantly. And C, it allowed them to do other things they wanted to do as well, more shelf space. In other words, not wins for 15, 20, 30 years from now, but next year we will have a budget win. Finally, you gotta show people a regret. The most interesting research in influence right now says this. People fear regret much more than excited by opportunity. Losing $50 feels worse than winning $50 most of the time. How do I explain this? Who has young daughters? Any of you have young daughters out there? Any parent of a young daughter knows this experience. You and your partner are saying, what do you want to do for summer vacation this year? Partner says, well, it's always hot in Austin. Why don't we, gosh, let's go to Iceland. That lily sounds cold. And the other person says, yeah, but what about Disney? Shouldn't we go to Disney? And the person says, I don't want to go to Disney. And then the person says, yeah, but if we don't go this year, she'll be too old, too old to enjoy it next year. Disney parking lots are filled with hundreds of thousands of people who simply don't want to be there. All right? <laughs> but they're afraid they're gonna miss out. If I don't adopt a sustainability agenda, what am I missing out on? What am I missing out on? That gets people's attention more, the fear of missing out than actually doing something. So you've gotta frame it that way. Finally, you gotta worry about language, and we're talking about language tonight. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at sustainability, I thought of two things. One is any good cause needs a great label. Like him or not, George Bush's administration was absolutely brilliant at labeling things. Think about this. No child left behind was his education campaign. If you voted against it, what were you voting to do? <laughs> his Anti-Terrorism Act was called the Patriot Act. If you voted against it, what were you being? Unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. You can't do these things. Labels have consequence. We've got to be choosy about our labels. If you don't believe me, like it or not, Obama is lousy at labels. <laughs> The opposition is great with labels. Healthcare, what's the label? No one knows what to call it except Obamacare. He lets some other group define his label. If you don't believe me, look what the Republicans did. Who remembers the phrase death panels? Anyone you know what death panels even are? It's basically counseling for hospice care. That's all it is. It's paying a doctor or a physician or a minister or somebody else to sit down and talk about should the family member be put in hospice or should major care be carried on. But what happens, the public has called it death panels, and that was the end of that uh, component of the bill. Labels do matter. Look right now, pink slime. How many of you cannot wait to feed your kids pink slime? It's absolutely a brilliant label when you think about it. Doesn't sound tasty to anyone, doesn't it? <laughs> labels matter. But even more than simple labels is what we call God terms. If you really want to be persuasive, you need to hook your idea to a couple God terms. God terms are words everyone worships and bows to. Everyone believes are absolutely vital. So what's a God term? Some of you old enough to remember in companies when there was a God term called customer focus, or there was a God term called quality, or transparency, or sustainability. Any idea that wins gets a God term attached to it. What was Obama's God term of the last election? Hope. Hope or change. What was McCain's? No one's yet figured it out. By the way, what was Bush's in 2004? War, terrorism, right? What was Kerry's? No one could figure it out. 
winning candidates find a word that may mean absolutely nothing, but it has huge impact because you can't be against it. So what's the ultimate God term in many organizations? Safety. You cannot argue against anything that is glued to safety. As part of our safety initiative, we should do this. You disagree, I say what? You don't believe in safety? You're stuck. It's a rhetorical trap God terms put things into. They're also, by the way, devil terms. But God terms are something language uses. Now, here's the challenge. If you worked in a company, they have this game called buzzword bingo sometimes. What they do is they have all these God terms of old, transparency, customer focus, quality, Six Sigma. And what employees do is when an executive gets up, as soon as the executive says one of these words, they check off that word on their bingo card. And if you get four in a row, you go bingo and you've won among your peers. <laughs> Any true God term would never go on bingo. So safety is never on God buzzword word bingo because it really is a serious God term. Sustainability may have been overused to the point it's lost its God term value. You might need to find a different God term. You also have to find brilliant metaphors and analogies. Great metaphors, great analogies make people understand what you're doing. And smart people understand life is metaphorical in some ways. If you find the right metaphor, people go, I got it now, I understand it. So think of the metaphors. Everyone uses them. We have medical metaphors. You, you, you're cutting into muscle, okay? You work from the heart. We have sports metaphors. You pitch a proposal. What's the metaphors for sustainability at work? Think about that. So those are some of my initial observations about sustainability. I think it's really potentially important if you can actually define it for me. But secondly, you need to be much more systematic about how you're going to actually pitch the idea of sustainability. It seems we're going to be ad hoc, and there's so many different measures, so many different meanings, Then, in the end, guess what? Does it become vanilla? Does it become everything? And philosophically, if something's everything, I'm not sure it's anything. So you've got to start thinking about that, I think, in terms of selling sustainability. No, that's great. There's several questions I'd love to ask. but uh, well, maybe. And I'm going to say some of the same things that John Thank said. God. <laughs> <laughs> Before uh, we were contacted by Jim about sustainability, and, and like John, I looked at it and thought, what in the world does sustainability mean? And we went to went and had a meeting last week to talk about what we, we would agree on. And I'm pretty sure by the end, Jim was thinking, what did I get into? Yes. Because neither John nor I are sold on this, on this uh, product. Because in my case, I don't get it. And what I'd like to do is, to kind of give you an overview of some of my concerns about the whole idea, and I'm going to come at it more from a psychological perspective. Now, first of all, I think I, uh, Jim made a w terrible mistake by inviting me in the first place. <laughs> my, my area is, is, I do look at language, but the, what I look at are a group of words called function words. These are pronouns, prepositions, articles, conjunctions. They're the smallest words in our vocabulary, and they're kind of the filler words. And they're interesting because they say a lot about the person. They are psychologically uh, actually quite interesting. Sustainability is not a function word. It's a noun. I don't do nouns. So <laughs> that forced me. <laughs> exactly. And, and that, uh, that, that forced me to go and start to read about sustainability and to think about it. Now, the second, full disclosure. I own a Prius. I uh, come to work in a bus, and uh, I recycle. So I'm, I'm not anti-sustainability, I guess, although it, as I'll talk in a few minutes, I still don't know what it means. I do these things because, well, you know, they just seem like the right things to do. I'm pro-environment, uh, and, and I've always been this way. And then. A few years ago, I woke up and went to bed at night. I was pro-environment. The next morning, I turned on television, and all of a sudden, I was being sh showing sustainability. What in the world really does sustainability mean? And that, that's really my question. So in preparation for this talk, I started looking. So I go to the, the absolute authority, which is, of course, Wikipedia, and <laughs> came up with the official de uh, definition that the UN came up with in 1987 talking about the nature of sustainable development. It refers to development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And frankly, this is by far the best definition I've seen. They are the most obscure definitions that I've, looked, that I've seen everywhere. But listen to this. The idea is uh, 
that it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Ability to meet their own needs. Now that's psychological. Hey, I'm a psychologist. What does that really mean? The ability to, well that, the ability to, to do this requires a basic human and actually uh, any kind of biological organism requires this, a certain type of resiliency. If there's change, we need to deal with it. We, and humans are incredibly resilient. In fact, if you look at modern day psychological theories and findings, one of the most amazing things about cockroaches, rats, and humans is we are amazingly resilient. When things go horribly, horribly wrong, people, cockroaches, and rats all do surprisingly well. <laughs> and this is gonna be, we're gonna come back to this over and over again. Okay, the ability to meet their own needs. What are their own needs? We don't have that many needs. We need to eat. We need to uh, have some shelter. We need to be able to reproduce and take care of the young. And frankly, that's about it. Do we need to have air conditioning we, here in Austin? Do we need air conditioning? Do we need uh, <laughs> birth control? Do we need... Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, drugs for polio or malaria. Many of you are thinking, well, yeah, those are needs. Well, guess what? I was born in a world in West Texas where it was hot with none of those. My generation did just fine. Yeah, there was uh, a lot of people died. Infant mortality was higher. There were these kind of downsides, but our generation met its own needs. And this is an issue I want to come back to. Now, As we are thinking about this, we need to ask the question, does the idea of sustainability make sense? And now we need to move back to the whole idea and really go back to the beginning, the whole idea of evolution. Think about what evolution is. The whole idea of evolution is, is that organisms survive. When the environment turns ugly, some organisms are able to survive through it and others don't and they die off and that's the way life is. Dinosaurs were not sustainable. But think about this. If there had been a committee of dinosaurs trying to say, okay, let's be sustainable, we wouldn't be here today. In other words, <laughs> you know, we get to this issue that organisms are sustain sustainable or not, and in all probability they are. The second issue is we can start looking at other kinds of situations where we see uh, horrible things happen. Look at uh, Europe in the period of the Black Plague where a high percentage of the population dies. Uh, next generation was able to meet its own needs. And one thing they did was they came over here to the New World, slaughtered most of the Native Americans. Uh, they were able to meet their own needs, at least the, the Europeans were and the surviving Native Americans were. The fact is, is that systems evolve. The next generation, no matter how bad it might be, meets its own needs. If we start thinking like that, what do we really mean by sustainability? I also think it's interesting to look at this in terms of kind of what if scenarios for us. What if there is a massive epidemic that uh, wipes out three quarters of the world's population. Okay, it's kind of a bummer, but the, the survivors are going to do just fine. What if there is uh, massive wars, nuclear wars, whatever? The humans who are still surviving will probably meet their own needs and they'll do just fine. And if they don't, the cockroaches and rats will probably do just fine, start over, and there'll be a whole new set of changes in evolution. The bottom line will be okay. Everything will be beautiful because whatever is whatever happens will meet its own needs. And I'm using almost uh, ridiculous examples, but on a certain level, they're not ridiculous. For example, one is, what if we run out of oil? I remember I, I'm from West Texas, and this is maybe if you're from Midland, you don't understand sustainability because you're living in a godforsaken part of the world that. Anything could happen and it wouldn't be uglier. It, you know, it's pretty much, pretty much the same. But the, I, I remember uh, having this discussion with my father saying, because there was this, this concern, well, we could run out of oil. And he pointed out, we'll never run out of oil. 
which occurred to me to be the most ridiculous idea I've ever heard because everybody has read that we've run out of oil. He said, no, what will happen is as we run out of oil, the price of oil will go up and we, people will be highly motivated to come up with other forms of energy. And the fact is we'll always have oil because it will either be so expensive or we'll have new technology that will take over for it. We are resilient. Humans are resilient. If we are living in a polluted world and it gets in the way of our everyday life, we will make changes. And it gets back to what John was saying. If there is an immediate need for something, we will make immediate changes. Yes, there's going to be some terrible downsides. Huge amounts of people might be hurt. But in terms of sustainability, we'll do just fine. And this brings me back to the issue of language. Is sustainability a good word? Is it a meaningful word? And I, my bias is it, does, it doesn't make much sense to me that ultimately it's a, a buzzword. It's a code word for pro-environment. It's a code word that makes us feel good. It's a code word for community. And this idea of environment and community, they're great. We, I love these words. I mean, that's why I like a Prius. That's why I like to take take uh, the bus, which is it does boost my sense of community. It does boost my sense of responsibility, my, my sense of environment. It makes me feel good. It makes me feel self-righteous. It makes me feel smug. And that, I think, is really one of the selling points of sustainability. It's one of these things, and it's, it's like many thing, parts of the whole idea of community or religion or other belief systems, which is anything that makes us feel closer to the community, that's great. So from a linguistic perspective, sustainability is a fine term, and it might make us feel good about ourselves. But as a really deep structure concept, I don't think it, it holds as much water. It, it doesn't make as much psychological sense as I would like it to be. The bottom line linguistically and otherwise is we'll be just fine. We'll be OK. So. Well, well thank you for that. And, and again, so many places to start, and, and, and resiliency is a, maybe a, a better framing of it. But uh, the, the drought, let's just take the drought in Texas right now. In terms of vivid examples, new evidence, uh, near-term consequences, so we're, it's right in front of us. And, and it's a pretty st strong word. It feels like a, a mm -hmm. strong word. Uh, it's not a code word. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go we'll look at it. Isn't that going to kind of drive some of this past just the code word stuff, the community stuff, and into what do we what do we do? We need to force action. I live in a neighborhood where people are drilling wells for themselves. It's helping the well drilling people. But basically, guess what? My neighbor is doing fine. My grocery store is doing fine. Uh, there's no okay. short. There's no short term consequence for the. There's a drought. There's no short-term thing that's affected anyone in my neighbor in any way except they're paying more for water. That's about it. But that's so, it's so fatalistic. And I mean, it's so to, to assume that, you know, to say evolution is going to all going to be okay and beautiful at mm -hmm. some point in the future mm -hmm. is just kind of st sticking our heads in the sand. No, I mean, do, do, no, do, no. Do, doesn't, aren't humans kind of driven by empathy and kind of yes, going out? Yes, of course. <laughs> and that's, that's why we, we do some things. But the reality is we'll do just fine. It reminds me of the research on happiness. Mm -hmm. If you go to, uh, I spend time in Mexico. I will, there, there are small towns that I will go to where there's tremendous poverty. Uh, people live in, in hovels. It's a, and by US standards, it's really quite striking. Mean levels of happiness in Mexico are higher than they are in the United States. The fact is, is in it, that the things that drive happiness are not uh, having you know, living in a nice place or, you know, water is great and uh, <laughs> having your place not burned down is great. But the, the reality is, is that we don't need to think about this in terms of material things. I'm not sure if that's what you were getting. No, at. no, and I agree with that. But, but people always are going to push back on, they push back on change almost reflective, reflectively. Right. And if you start saying, well, people in Mexico are happy, there's a perception of lifestyle level. Mm -hmm. They're not going to just go, oh, okay, fair enough then we'll do that. Oh, less water. Oh, uh, the God forsaken. We're all going to be like in Midland now. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. That, and, uh, and people in Midland are very happy. That's right. <laughs> it, it just, uh, it, it seems a little uh, counterintuitive to the resource scarcity is, and you brought up the classic kind of approach of scarcity, that 
It's just how we pitch the idea mm -hmm. uh, and that it'll all be okay. That just doesn't strike me as how humans tend to respond. We tend to oh, want to, we're always trying to shape the future to our own benefit. Here's the deal, when you say the word change to almost anyone, the first thought is, I'm gonna lose something. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take something yeah. away. Change can add things or move things around, or sometimes do nothing. But when you say we want to change to a more sustainable agenda, the first thought is, what do I have to give up? And my perception, if I ask 100 people in Austin, just randomly selected, should we change to a more sustainable environment? They'll say, I like sustainability. I don't know what it means, but it sounds good. But I don't want to make any changes because change is going to take things away. So your language matters. And when we say we want to make a change, you're going to scare people to death in that process. And yeah. if the mm -hmm. drought comes, the environment's bringing the change for us. We don't even have to make that decision. And we, we will adapt, and we adapt remarkably quickly. We let our, our front yards die. We, we move to trees. condos. Exactly. But we, we adapt. Not, you're talking about gen, you know, whole things change from one generation to the next. You know, adaptation strikes me as a word that is a long frame mm -hmm. word. You know, it's whether I'm going to grow wings so I can fly somewhere else where there actually is water. Mm -hmm. it, we're we're going we're gonna to shape the future much more quickly and rapidly and maybe not to the benefit of the people around us. Your neighbors are drilling wells. So, I mean, there's a, there's a hastening of our own demise in that, that, that is what kind of one of the things that worries me about Stone it. Stone Age didn't end because you ran out of stones. <laughs> 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 and I guess that's how what about, I'm saying. How about the Iron Age? Iron Age, <laughs> iron. I mean, take us all, we're not gonna, somebody will come a new technology. In other words, I think what he's saying, and I agree with it, we're an adaptable species. Now, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think anyone in this room is opposed to sustainability. The question is, why does it not get traction? Right, and I think right. the reason why is it has this vagueness to it that we can't put our hands on. And it sounds like some forced change, and people feel relatively comfortable. Now, you do, crises used to get attention. Yeah, no and, question. And a good example of this actually yeah. is why I take the bus and drive a Prius. I'm a cheapskate, and the, and the price of cars and driving is so high, and we see this in the culture, we, we're resilient, we adapt, we get rid of the big gas go. You made a choice. Yeah. You, you, made, a, you made a choice to do that. Yeah. And what I, I think to your point, I think we use But language. I didn't have a choice that the gas prices went up. I, I adapted. Okay, you, you, made, you made choices that, that got you there in response to something mm -hmm. so that you could shape your, your future and your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, he, had to get, he had to get immediate benefit from the Prius. He had to know he was going to save X amount of money real quick. Mm -hmm. He had to get some quick win for himself. So Exxon has this absolutely silly ad right out now that says, you know, if every American had properly inflated titles, titles, t tires rather, they would save 700 million gallons of gasoline each year. Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? How many of you, I mean, obviously we all care conceptually, but practically they never bring home the point. You've got to show me what I'm going to get out of this week, right? I will save $240 next year, will get my attention. Politicians who are good never say, well, I vote for me, I'll reduce taxes. They get on TV, say, vote for me, I'll reduce taxes so you'll be able to get that vacation home. Vote for me, I'll reduce taxes so you'll be able to get kids through school. They give you some immediate benefit. Tell me the immediate benefit of sustainability. But I, That's the challenge same. right there. <laughs> well, I, I can't get some doctors on this campus to turn off their office lights at night. Why should and I? So I uh, <laughs> because you're smart enough to know that those little no, kinds I of things add it. up. I don't know. I like, don't see that. Mm -hmm. You show me how I do it. Now, smart grids, for example, become more mm -hmm. interesting because smart grids at least give you a psychological win when you see the power go down. But I leave my light on sometimes. I figure well, now, somebody's going to clean it up. Well, I don't even on. think about it. I, I leave my computer if, on all night long. If I had a display, it, oh, don't do that. <laughs> I do. So, yeah, I always if I had a little do because display, I don't want to turn it off. I don't want what would happen? If I, okay, if, I, if we had a little we'll display, if, if we had a little display in your office that showed you how you were contributing to the university saving money. No, no. And how it contributes to me getting something. There's uh, a difference. No, no, no. If it's relevant to the university saving money, then I might pay attention. No, I wouldn't. I want it for me. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it forward. It's going to end up the on your more doorstep you pretty, pretty, pretty soon. I don't the, believe the, that. that. I don't know that. Well, see, the, here's the, the other thing that worries me about both of your arguments is that the scale of what the, the, the issue is. Seven billion people on a planet. You know, the, the, there's not a lot of resources that renew at the scale at which we consume them. We don't distribute the resources very well based on who needs them. It, it'll all work out. No. That's the beauty. It will Understood. all work out. Okay. And by the way, and does anyone know what 7 billion looks like? 
<laughs> no, I, I agree. That's the, the point. It's an impossible and No one cares thing. about seven billion. I mean, who was it? Was it Stalin said, you know, uh, killing one person is a tragedy. What's the other part? What was the line? Yeah, no. if, if you kill one person, it's a tragedy. If you kill millions, it's no one even... It's a statistic. It's a statistic. Yeah. And there's some wisdom about that in an evil way that, guess what? You seven billion sounds really compelling to somebody, but not to me. Well, Show me how it's going to affect me in my life, my <laughs> kids, my family, even my colleague here. <laughs> then I'll pay attention. Yeah. So you've got to bring home the so what to people. Yeah. Okay. And the sustainability has these big, big macro concepts that sound wonderful at first glance, but doesn't incite any behavior. Well, I'll get, let me ask one more question, and then we'll get into audience questions here. Um, on a on a university campus, you know, if, if sustainability is a code word, mm -hmm. uh, For if making if, us smug and feel good about ourselves, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that we can feel good and associate with others, people who think like exactly. us, exactly, exactly, make, no, make, it's make <laughs> And there's there's principles of. <laughs> I may not have a job after <laughs> this evening. This is, I really appreciate you all both. It's a wonderful call. <laughs> yes, that's great. I need a leader. <laughs> And you're talking about the kind of principles about how we dissect it and do it better. Yeah. Now, isn't it part of higher education's responsibility that when you have uh, 18 and 19 year olds who get sustainability thrown at them from every angle, from people like me, mm -hmm. from corporations, from different departments, all, the, all over the place, and it does have elements of hope and of, of something worthwhile to do, mm -hmm. isn't it then our obligation to help them break down the code word and kind of break it's, it apart so they understand it? And that's it? why we're here, because it's a code word that's uh, yes. a fake word that means virtually nothing that is, that is I think, <laughs> philosophically close to bankrupt. And, and maybe not, but the whole purpose of education is to push. And we want to, as, as a faculty member, I want to poke and push and have people come up with good counter arguments. It's no skin off my nose. But the whole point of college is, I'm not going to tell you what truth is because I don't know what truth is. I don't know how I got here, but the point is, is our job as faculty and, and our job as students, when we are students, is to be challenged and think these issues through. It, it, yeah, and, and are we doing that? Do you think the university, I mean, so, so if, if we do that well, right, then uh, months from now, if I roll something out, then we would, I would expect and hope for students to challenge me on it, challenge me, the university, on that program. That's right, to think so, about it, to, abs to, to think about it. In other words, you come out with a new program, and I hope the people here will think, well, that's just another bullshit sustainability thing. <laughs> or they'll say, well, that's a really good idea. I can see how that's going to be beneficial to the university, to me, in John's case. That's what I'm saying, behavior. Yeah. Give me a behavior and tell me why I should get that behavior. Turn off your computer over the weekend. Why? Why? Exactly. Because it saves the university money. Who cares? The university. Yeah. I'm not a minister. He's a chair. You're, he cares. A I'm a faculty member. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah. And he's how a, much? He's a chair, so show he me. Has to care. Show, and show me how much. How much? You know, and what do okay. I get out of it? I mean, it's, it sounds utilitarian, and it is. But look, there's how many different initiatives on campus any one day? Sustainability is probably one of fifty that hit students every day. There's a health one, there's a Gregory Gym one, there's a student government one, there's a going to class one, by the way. I mean, there's a whole bunch of initiatives. Why should I pay attention to sustainability over those others? Because there is so much push on everything, mm -hmm. right? Fair there's enough. a safety one, there's lock up your PC one, new laptop one in the newspaper today. Uh, what, well, you know, I will what do- does, What rises I will, this I will do my laptop because I got my data on it, I got my writing on it, so I will work hard to pick my laptop much more than I worry about turning off that light bulb. So your challenge is tell me why I should pay attention to that light bulb more than I should pay attention to my laptop that has all my data on and making sure it doesn't get stolen. Mm -hmm. and that's the issue I think sustainability has to face because our lives are filled with initiatives. And unless you can show me why your initiative is more important personally to me, I may salute it, but I'm not gonna pay attention. You know, a historic example is this. So, okay, no, please. No, no. A historic example is this. Go ahead and line up if you have One a One of the best advertising campaigns, you don't have to like it, I find it offensive personally, was Bush, Senior Bush's ad campaign against Michael Dukakis towards the end of the election. Most of you don't remember, but there was this two ads put out at the same identical time. One was called Boston Harbor. It was the ultimate sustainable ad. It showed dead fish, it showed oil and water, it showed polluted bubbles. And the rhetorical structure said, do we want Michael Dukakis to do for America what he's done for Massachusetts? A second ad put out exactly the same time was called prison furlough programs. Later became known as Willie Horton ads. 
What happened was it was about prison for the state of Massachusetts had where prisoners got time out of the prison to do things. And it says some of these guys have robbed stores. Somebody's raped somebody. Which ad had an impact on it? Which ad had an effect on the electorate? Prison furloughs or Boston Harbor? Boston Harbor is a sustainable one. Guess what? Had no impact whatsoever. Willie Horton had a huge impact because what? I don't want somebody to rob my house. I don't want somebody to rape my wife. It brought home the point immediately, didn't it? There was an immediate so what. The same exact rhetorical structure. Both ended with what Michael Dukakis would do for America way different messages. And the challenge I put in front of you is how do you create an ad that don't take this the wrong way, and somebody will, I'm sure. How do you create an ad like Willie Horton for sustainability as opposed <laughs> to the Boston <laughs> Harbor ad for wait, wait, Because wait. that brings home yeah. the point, doesn't it? It brings home the so what of sustainability. Yeah. Until you can bring it home to me, I'm not going to pay attention. Because I agree, most of us are adaptable species. The species is adaptable. So we'll be fine. But if you want that immediate one, you got to show me why turning off that light matters to me right away in some ways. Okay. That's my take home. Why would Willie Horton turn off? <laughs> no, no, no. His... <laughs> <laughs> see, somebody could take that out of context and can see this showing up. Uh, I see right. it showing up. Go ahead and introduce yourself and your question. Uh, I'm Andrew. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, I'm Andrew with the Campus Environmental Center. Good for you. And um, I thought that this was very illuminating. Um, very cool topic, but um, one of my questions, although I have many, is um, <laughs> is a, a main point that uh, both of you brought up was actually that we are really resilient um, as a species. And my question is, um, it is more of a challenge, is that really true? How resilient is humanity um, compared to the whole um, scheme of things? And Humanity's faced a lot of man-made type catastrophes before, but I think that global natural resource decline is something that's very different than something we faced before. And like I think there are actually examples, for example, on uh, Easter Island, for instance, where they got rid of all their natural resources and well, they weren't resilient. I mean, it completely eradicated their um, uh, culture. So. Um, how exactly could you guys respond to that or Did, that resilience? I know your answer. Oh, you know the answer. I know your answer. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I know I, your answer. You're going to say the cockroach was a finer Easter Island. <laughs> <laughs> All right? No. <laughs> no. No. They're resilient. Okay. Okay. That's not fine. And by the way, the Easter so, Islanders, probably some of them may have rowed someplace else, right? Who knows? They may be exactly. in Peru now. They did not just sit there thinking, man, there goes another whatever. <laughs> I guarantee you they did something. And... If, if they're all gone, then I assume that they went someplace else. <laughs> they probably went but, to Peru. <laughs> Maybe Chile, but probably Peru. The, 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 the thing that probably would be interesting to know is once you got down to recognizing that the resource, you were using them up faster than your population was, was going to be able to survive, what amount of, you both, both incited pain as, mm -hmm. as a necessary ingredient in change. Mm -hmm. and. But who wants to reach that level of pain? I mean, who wants to reach that level of desperation nobody where does. you can't see laying nobody. on the Nobody does, but it works. Exactly. Nobody does. No, does anybody want to have a civil war where almost a million people are killed? They do it. What, in other words, these if, are things that happen. So to pick up on Andrew's question, what if the planet's already at this point? but we just have so many cable channels to distract us, we just don't realize that we should be trying to head to colonize Mars right now rather than stick it out on this island. We need a bigger crisis. How many of you should lose weight? Most of us should lose weight. We're not, though. We go to the doctor. He tells us to on a regular basis. It's important to lose weight. You can read the data losing weight's good for you. There's no one who says gaining weights are probably a good thing for most of us. What will produce a weight change is what? You get a serious medical malady diabetes, heart disease. You go to your doctor, he says, you've had a heart attack, you're in the hospital, only way to live longer is lose weight. Guess what? People start losing weight at that point. I don't think it's sane, but that's how everyone is. So I need to find that point, mm -hmm. that inflection point. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that inflection point's been around for about 40 years, if I remember from my college days. Now, I know it's a global, long-term thing, 
but you can't have an inflection point in 1970 that was there that's still the inflection point today for average people, right? And, okay. And, okay. You, and you do, and by the way, you do see these inflection points all, in all sorts of places. When uh, Lake Erie becomes essentially a polluted place where you can't even eat the fish, everybody buys into changing the rules. When the river fall, catches on fire, people that's are into that's river. Exactly, yeah. That's exactly right. Okay, you know, thank it takes you. 20 years. By the way, was cleaning up the Hudson River a sustainable move or an unsustainable move? Did it create more pollution when they opened up that stuff or less pollution? I, Interesting question. I, I think the pursuit of the cleaner river is the... Is Even the if pursuit. you actually make it less sustainable <laughs> for a long period but, of time. No, it's just part of a large system. It's not... Okay. I'm, thank you, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> we are taking extreme points for a reason. No, this is... But this is... I, I knew exactly what I was... Dan, I was walking into. He was stunned. <laughs> My name is Mono, and I'm a part of the Engineers for Sustainable World. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a couple of questions for both of you. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. It was a it was a wonderful talk. It was a perspective I've never considered looking at, <laughs> and I'm really glad I I I got to think that way too. So um, f for Dr. John, um, well, I don't know how, how how relevant this is, but like the the point that you're making about how you're not you're only going to act upon something if it if it pertains to you, how do you draw the line between selfishness and self-interest? And um, another another question for you is, um, so sustainability means that you try to meet the needs of, of the present without compromising the needs of the future, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's, it's a long-term thing. And you mentioned how if you want something done, you want it to be done, you want to see immediate results instead of long-term long -term repercussions. And But at the same time, you also said that um, re that people respond to regret better than they respond to benefits. Mm -hmm. So how do you think people are going to respond to the fact that 20 years from now, maybe uh, you, you said you have a daughter, maybe your great grandson does not have the same facilities you do. How is that current regret of thought going to affect, you know, the, the concept of sustainability and can we pitch that very same idea to people? You should come up and take my chair. Exactly. <laughs> Let me give you a couple answers. One, I do tend to believe, and it's probably a sad thing I believe it, I think most people are self-interested more than most? they're interested. I'd say all of them. I think that yeah. we were, we obeyed, there was a wonderful book, <laughs> Selfish Gene, years ago. Yeah. All right? and you can argue philosophy enough, but there is an argument made that people, by their nature, there's some degree of altruism in people, no question about it. But I think the core, you have to be, you, you protect yourself, you protect your loved ones. Right. Now, so that's what I say about that first part of your question. I think I'm answering that that way. Second thing is, though, the regret is sh long term. The reward is short term for me. And what happens is we always notice the short term. So, yes, I don't, you know, the long term, maybe my great, great grandchildren will get something out of me turning off the light in that building tonight. <laughs> but right now, probably not. I'm probably not. But let's suppose <laughs> they have to think I do. On the other hand, the question is, what do I get out of it right now? What is my meat family government? I'm not disagreeing with anything you're saying. I'm saying you guys have to make that case in a more compelling way. Because you, you, there's a concept called the true believer. There's a rhetoric of true believers. And they never can understand why anyone would disagree with them. And they're always right about what they're saying in big philosophical terms in their minds. But when you check that, when, when the rubber hits the road, when you literally have to actually do something about it, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a religion. Which, uh, I, know, I love religion, but guess what? Behavior-wise, it's a very different thing for an everyday basis. So I agree. Maybe I, I have no idea what's going on. Honestly, I really don't care about my great great grandkids. I won't see them. Uh, uh, I don't care about them. Well, well, uh, actually, I care about my children and my grandchildren, if I ever have any. And by the way, I'm not sure my two older children should ever have grandkids, by the way. But nonetheless, assuming they happen at some point, I have a six-year-old. I'm 59 years okay. old. I'm probably not going to see his great grandchildren. Right. Okay. Jamie, okay. You want to but, you? And the other issue about this regret issue. Guess what? Talk to anybody who's 70, 80, or old, older, yeah. and they will have regrets by the lives that you've got. I can't believe my grandkids. They spend all the time looking at the, the iPad. They play games. They're saying your generation is going to hell. Well, every grandparent talks about the new generation going to hell. They all have regrets that the the, the generation uh, after them isn't living in the same old world that they were in, in the good old days. So the fact is, yes, we are going to have regrets that uh, your kids aren't behaving the way that uh, we did when we were young. Yeah. But don't we want to minimize those? Yeah. No, we wanna... no, no, people want to maximize the rewards. Most yeah. of these people have iPads or iP iPhones. 
Most people in college have iPads or iPhones. And, and Are you, you willing to give those up? And you all say you have a good life. I say when I was growing up, I had a good life. I guarantee you my grandparents thought that we, our, my generation was a bunch of loser kids because we watched the, w television had been invented. The, the point is, is that's just, that, it, that'll happen. So <laughs> when you get 80, no matter what, whether you're sustainable or not, you're going to look at the, the youngest generation with just deep regret. So you have all that to look forward to. Next whole, we like to sell whole One more question. Really, really quick. Okay. We want to um, one more question, question for Dr. Jamie. Um, relating to happiness, and you said you've done research on happiness, I just want to know how positive psychology, which has really been trending in the, by the last few years, can play into promoting sustainability. Uh, positive psychology is bought into the whole sustainability. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's a natural for it. <laughs> and it's, uh, but again, I, I think a lot of it is the idea of community and connectedness. And that's a really important issue going across it, whether it's sustainability or not. Uh, so it's, it is positive psychology is a natural fit for, for uh, uh, sustainability movement. And that's, I'll leave it there. All right, thank <laughs> you, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Saeed. I'm an economics and accounting senior at UT. I have two questions. First one is very small and brief, and second one has two parts. So <laughs> I'll do the small <laughs> brief. Pre -law. Pre -law. Okay. Pre -law. I'll try my best. So both towards Dr. Jamie. So God, from the very God. beginning till the end, you say everything will be fine, mm -hmm. but you didn't really point out how. So I feel like the answer lies to abstract power in a parenthesis mm -hmm. uh, with the word, three letter word God, everything. Is that what your solution or answer? If not, what abstract power, how it will be? Mine is more in any situation, humans adapt and they are, they become, close that it, and that's the way that, that's the history of humanity one of my favorite books is a book by Thomas Friedman called from Jerusalem to Beirut yeah. or from Beirut to Jerusalem and in it he talks about this is during the early 1970s when a, a horrible civil war was going on in Beirut and he and his uh, wife were there and they maybe even had a young child they there were uh, there were three groups all at war with one another. There were explosions every place. Uh, they would talk about running out to get food during the, 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 uh, the, the, the peace times. It would be, you know, for two hours in the afternoon. Uh, how he and a friend would sneak to a golf course in the sand, hitting the ball and so forth. And he said it was, in writing this book now 20 years later, talking to other people who had survived that with him, it was the most exciting, wonderful time of his life. The fact is, and it goes just against what uh, Hobbes talked about, mm -hmm. talking about when the government falls apart, that people become mean, brut life becomes mean, brutish, and short. The fact is, that's not true. The reality is, is even during hard times, people bond together. And this is kind of, I think that's much of the human condition. Some believe in God, some don't, but the fact is, I think that a lot of the, the cement there is the human connection. Second question, real quick. So uh, it looks like from the very beginning till the end, you're grasping with the idea or definition of sustainability. And I took a class in energy technology policy at McCombs, and I'm not gonna go into details of the definition, but I'll bring one example of you using a Prius. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that what the definition of sustainability uh, to make it simple, the same technology, a car, that's the concept, using the same car with a different concept, more efficient, less money, and person like you who's buying it. But the second part, you can afford it, but somebody works in McDonald's, they can't. That's right. So if, didn't you embrace the idea of sustainability? Because if you didn't, you wouldn't have a Prius. Mm -hmm. And the second idea, if there's no research on sustainability or efficiency, people like work in McDonald's or like low-income people, they wouldn't be able to own a Prius. There shouldn't be a name Prius. All cars should have the same technology. Answering oh. the question, both of you grasping, why not leaving the computer on? Who cares? Because if you come with the technology or the sustainability that takes 150th power you wouldn't care to leave it on for two weeks and there wouldn't be dim it. Isn't what the definition of sustainability? Yeah, and, and I agree with you. And uh, by the way, I think a pre 
all the evidence on the Prius is it's a uh, it's kind of a fake concept in sustainability in terms of the amount of energy and the the raw materials putting the whole system together. It's obscenely expensive for all these issues that you're talking about, and but but its appeal and I didn't appreciate this when I bought it is is the self righteousness factor, the smugness factor, and I'm a little embarrassed by it, and I'm kind of not in in. There's an irony here that I just that I kind of embrace, but I don't disagree with you that uh, all things being equal, I do think it's a great idea for us to uh, make things far more efficient. I think it's a wonderful idea. And, and I get the social equity part of your, of your question there. Mm -hmm. In terms of if, well, if yeah. it's a good idea, then it's, it should be good for everybody. We Absolutely. should strive towards that. I would make another, I, yeah. on social equity real quickly. Sustainability may be a rich person's idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure really poor people would ever buy half the stuff you're talking about as a sustainability argument. I think there's an incredible luxury for talking about sustainability. Uh, that, you know, if, if you're scraping a living every day, I think you're going to burn coal because you're going to keep your house warm, keep your kids fed. I think you're not going to say it's bad for the environment, it's good for me right now. We're very lucky that we can talk about reducing power because we have always power on. I, was in, I followed a group in, in Oregon who built chimneys. And building a chimney is a very difficult thing to do to cook in. It's amazing what happens. And they've devised these really very effective chimneys. The trouble is they're too expensive. They're beautiful art and they work very efficiently. But even $50 to ship this and put it in a poor country is too expensive for most people. So of course they burn coal, of course they pollute their air on a regular basis. They poison their children sometimes trying to heat the place. But if you're living off the equivalent of $10 a year, a $50 chimney, even though it's sustainable, is not even imaginable. And so I, I would challenge you to show me how sustainability is going to hit those people at the bottom of the economic strata. And by the way, the bottom of economic strata is not that far down. <laughs> there are a lot of economic stratas elsewhere that are much further down. How do you impact those people? If you can convince those people to do stuff, I think everything else falls from that in some ways. Well, we're going to take two more questions, but I think you've hit on the topic for the next next lecture. Thank you. I hope I didn't take too much time. No, no, you're fine. We have a couple more questions, though. Hi, my name is Chris. I'm staff here at UT. And my question is, you've mentioned a lot about how the word sustainability is ineffective. It's not one of these God terms that you had mentioned of, say, the Patriot Act or uh, death coaches or whatnot. It's not very vivid. It's not very clear death in people's minds. Death, death panels. Death, death panels. Yeah. It's, it's very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. And so what would your suggestion be for a more effective term that could be used not only in the cities but also in the rural communities um, that would be just yeah. as effective in showing people Mm -hmm. that they can, uh, uh, the, the need not to exceed our capacity, our resource well, capacity. Generally those good. words tend to be more negative than positive. Poison. <laughs> <laughs> Extinction? No, no extinction no. is too long. Extinction is too far away. Yeah, yeah. Poison. I don't know if, I, I don't, I'm just making this up. I've not thought about this, but first thought is you need to find a word that make people go, oh, sh oh my God, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm poisoning my kids. I mean, think pink slime. It's disgusting. <laughs> No one wants to feed the, and by the way, that's a completely made up word, right? <laughs> it's a meat product, all right? And I'm not in favor of pink slime in any way, matter or form. But now pink slime will lose its impact relatively quickly. There's no question about it. But how many of sense, some of those companies who made it are essentially out of business with the loss of a couple thousand jobs, by the way, all right? And pink slime is not necessarily that bad for you as far as I can understand, but the word itself sounds so horrible. You go to your kid's school and say, are you serving pink slime to my children? So you need some sort of word that makes people go, oh my God, I don't want to do it. You want something that makes them look bad if they do it also in some ways, right? I mean, you, I, I'm not thought about what the right word, because you see, my problem is I don't necessarily understand what sustainability is yet. And I would also, Please. in terms of the short term aspect of this, if you're going to the, to the small communities and so forth, make it economically feasible. Yeah. You know, change, change the incentive structure so it makes the difference for them right now. And don't don't sell this vague sustainability business because it it's, it it doesn't it, it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> last question. Right, let me get, let me get one last example. Sure. <laughs> All of you have cell phone chargers, right? Some of you have been old enough to have many cell phones, have multiple cell phone chargers. 
Understand, why does every cell phone need a separate charger? It's huge money. Starting last year in the Euro European Union, every new phone made will require exactly the same charger. Whether it be an Apple, a Nokia, a Blackberry, the same charger. What got their attention was not convenience, it wasn't money, it was environmental issues. But it wasn't the environment, it was leakage. Every one of those charges goes in the ground and leaks out bad chemicals. Poison. For poison for thousands <laughs> of years. If I say it's a sustainability option, I'm not sure what got people's attention. Leakage of chemicals into the ground. By the way, that's why fracking is at least getting some negative press, because the presumed leakage into the water base, right? There's no good word for it. By the way, whoever chose fracking has to be an idiot. <laughs> All right? I mean, seriously, give me a break. I can argue both sides of these issues, right? But you see, the proponents, get, people argue against fracking. If they can talk about something that makes people think groundwater being polluted, poisoning your kid, you'll do something about it. Luckily, they came up with the word fracking on the energy side, which is just idiotic, so they lose traction with that by itself. But think about the UK. Think of that, not UK, but European Union. It was the notion of an immediate consequence in people's minds, groundwater in the ground, polluting everyone. It wasn't 500 years from now, all that's probably the impact. They imagined it would leak out right away. That got people's attention, okay. corrosion. Yes, so the, the previous speaker kind of, um, questioner kind of touched on this, and especially, <laughs> like, <laughs> I would hire him. <laughs> <laughs> or especially like, so like what God words we use, like what issues would, I, I know you kind of touched on it, but I'd like, if possible, uh -huh. if y'all could expand on that, like. If we were given control of. Like, uh, like the presentation of this whole movement. Well, let, me like, give you, okay. let, 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 me give, let me give you one suggestion. There's a wonderful book came out a couple years ago called Nudge. You ought to read Nudge. It's a very interesting book because, for example, who's been to Schiphol Airport? Have you been to Amsterdam's airport? It's going to disgust some of you. But every men's urinal has a little fly painted right in it. Why do they put a fly on that urinal? Aim. Aim. Any mom knows a chariot floating in the toilet will make sure any little boy makes it right. All right? <laughs> All right? Rather than having Singaporean police there to arrest you if you miss, rather than having big neon signs, aim correctly, they made it so easy and to turn into a game. <laughs> so if I was a sustainability guru, I would do certain things like that. I would have automatic off lights, for example, when there's, uh, I don't like those sensors, but nonetheless you could put something in there. I would find ways of building sustainability where you don't even notice it. I would nudge people into it. Uh, UT, you know this in the cafeterias, for example. Uh, five years ago, Kinsolving had trays. There are no trays in consolving anymore. Why did they get rid of the trays? No. Food wastage as well. Hmm. Oh, what was the 30 some? What was the number for 30? You know what it is. Oh, we reduced our total food waste by 48%. 48% by simply getting rid of trays. Now, here's the nice thing about UT. Everyone, we, the three of us live in a Peter Pan world. Everyone else stays 18. We keep getting older <laughs> at UT. <laughs> what does this mean? No one today ever knew there was a tray in the cafeteria. And you've saved over 40% in terms of food wastage, and no one complains about it. Because why? People overloaded trays with junk, and what happens? They threw that stuff away. Now you can, you can go back as many times as you want. You can still gain your fresh from 15, but you've got to do it over and over again on plates, right? A little bit of exercise. You've got a little exercise in the process, too. <laughs> but understand, that's a perfect example of what I would do in terms of sustainability. I would create an environment where it becomes more sustainable, and no one even knows it. And that's essentially what they've done on the tray thing, right? Yeah. Well, no freshman in consulting has any idea it was ever, trays ever existed here. And I would that's, get rid of the word sustainability. Would that would be the very first thing I'd do. It doesn't make sense. It is confusing, it's vague, it's just not helpful. If you're trying to reduce costs, reduce food waste, you, all of these can be uh, talked about individually, but the broad concept of sustainability doesn't make sense. And on that note, <laughs> and we've got we've several Such great, a <laughs> great yes, I'm not sure where I'm coming tomorrow now, <laughs> but there's several great ideas for what we could focus on for future lectures uh, in, in terms of shaping the word or looking at future words, uh, the social equity uh, deal and continuing to delve into this. I would encourage you, all of the, the folks who are here who are students, uh, take this back into your own thinking about sustainability and into your classrooms. And, and when we roll stuff out, definitely bring it to us. 
uh, challenge us. And I want to thank both of you for challenging uh, me and the audience <laughs> and, and being here. But Dr. Daly, Dr. Pendermaker, thanks a lot for thanks being so here. And thank you all for being here. Thank you.